Artificial intelligence is facing a critical test this week when chipmaker NVIDIA reports its earnings on Wednesday. NVIDIA is the best performing S&P 500 stock this year. And back in May, NVIDIA saw the third largest one day market cap gain in U.S. history. Those gains were primarily driven by the company's beyond bullish revenue outlook for its chips that power AI. So Wall Street's obviously all in, and I'm sure quite a few shareholders who are watching right now are as well. But are the biggest names in Silicon Valley signing off on the AI chip craze? I know you guys are in on the, the AI craze, but what about NVIDIA? Is it getting too frothy? Joining me now, tech entrepreneur and angel investor Jason Kalkanis. J. Cal, of course, is the founder of Launch and the co-host of the All In podcast, which is epic. Love it. It's good to see you, Jason. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Liz. I, I got to ask you about this NVIDIA situation to kick it off. HSBC yeah. just hiked NVIDIA's price target to $780 a share, which basically implies an 80% upside from here. I mean, it's already gained 211% year to date. It's PE's 241. And by the way, this morning it was at 237, so it's been climbing all day. Is the exuberance around this name and what it can do for AI really warranted? Well, the AI revolution is a very real thing. We're seeing it in startups. We're seeing every single company we invest in, and we invest in 150 startups per year. Um, every single one of them is using AI either internally to get gains or incorporating into the products. Just like the mobile revolution, you saw every single category of service or product uh, be ported to your smartphone. And before that, we saw every single service get ported to the web that the same thing's happening right now. So the need for compute is amazing. Uh, we finally found a way to have these uh, chips uh, get utilized in the world. There was a long period of time uh, when there was really no way to leverage all the CPU power. Uh, right. The things we needed more of were bandwidth, storage, uh, and battery life. So this is amazing. We have this, we have this new revolution. It's going to change everything in terms of how we live, and it's already happening. I would say companies are becoming 30% more efficient. Now, when you look at this one company, yeah. this is very overheated. Um, it's the biggest name. Um, but you have to ask yourself a fundamental question. Will they have a monopoly? So I hope Lisa Khan's not listening, but that is the question. Will they have a de facto or a monopoly on these chips? I think the answer is no, or it's unlikely. They will have you know, a year or two of being the only game in town or the best game in town. But you got to remember, software is also part of this. So people are going to figure out ways to get gains from the software. And so I am not buying it at this point. Uh, I, I will buy shares in companies for, from time to time uh, in the public markets. And this is one I think is a little overheated. Okay. If, you, if you're really excited about it and you want to make a bet, sure, go ahead. It's, it's not going anywhere. Um, but I don't think this is a, a great price for it. Uh, maybe this tape will be used against me in a year or two <laughs> if they do get a monopoly. But I'm not betting they'll have a monopoly. I think there's other manufacturers, and this is the great thing about capitalism. Right. People will see this, Liz, and say, I want some of that revenue. And right now there's startups and big companies that have NVIDIA in their targets. It might take them a year or two to catch up and, and, and build competitive products. But the competition is coming. Well, they're, they're probably... The NVIDIA's margin is their opportunity. As you say, they are right now aiming for the top person, for the top of the food chain. And that, of course, would be Jensen yeah. Huang and, the, you know, yeah. and NVIDIA. But as you, as you look at the broader picture of AI, some of these AI yeah. ETFs, have actually just been flat year to date, flat year mm. over year, or maybe up 7% compared to the S&P 500, which is actually up more than 14% over the same amount of time. So as you continue to watch what's going on, is this not the best way? Our investor audience likes to get a piece of the next hot thing, and they think perhaps it would be in a basket of these names. Is that a mistake? Yeah, I, if you want to play the stock market, buy an index fund uh, that has the lowest uh, fees possible and enjoy uh, you know, the, the compounding uh, value of it. If you really want to buy individual equities, you got to sharpen your pencil and you got to do some analysis of them and, and you got to be willing to put in you know, hours every week. I would not, would definitely not be buying ETFs in this as a way to play it uh, because that's just not how winners emerge. It's generally a winner take most or all market. If you look at smartphones, uh, you know, Apple has done an amazing job in the West, in the modern world, first world, of capturing most of the earnings, most of the profitability. Now, sure, you have friends who have Android phones, but 
there's not much profitability in that hardware, is there? So you really want to study who the big winners are, and then you want to take a position in those, not uh, play the average, and then you'll get average results. And if you want average results, just buy whatever the Vanguard lowest fee index right, right. funds are and, well. and go about your life. <laughs> Is my best <laughs> Move this along. Is not Nothing to see though. here except <laughs> long-term compounded growth. So, Jason, yeah. when you're talking about new opportunities out there, yeah. upstarts, and then not to mm. mention big names that are about to list, we're waiting on Arm yeah. to file actual IPO paperwork. Arm used to be public yeah. as Arm Holdings, then SoftBank got it. There's been a whole bunch of different iterations for it. Um, we know that Reddit is supposed to go public, Instacart, Stripe, Chime. Uh, any of these names, what do you like here? And what should people mm. buy? And are you one of those people who says, do not buy on the day yeah. a company goes public? Yeah, I don't think that you should you should always be patient as an investor, really get to know these companies um, and really look at the management uh, and the customers and the engagement of those customers. At the end of the day, a startup or even a big company is a team, its products uh, and its customers. And I, and I really stick to that fundamental analysis in everything I do. It's worked pretty well for me being the third or fourth investor in Uber <laughs> and uh, Robinhood and other companies like that. Uh, and I made those bets when those companies were in year one, right. uh, when I looked at the product, talk to the customers, and spend time with the teams. That's In all fact, you need to do. let's not I gloss over really that. Good bets. I don't want to gloss yeah. over the Uber thing. You put 25 grand into Uber as one of the very mm. first investors, and that today yeah. would be worth, what, about $100 million. So maybe, you know what to look more. for. <laughs> Pro probably yeah. more, yep. Yeah. But what is the number one thing you look for when a startup founder walks into your office and says, give me money? Yeah. Um, it's a great question. Uh, we, we look at the team. We really like to see the uh, what we call product velocity internally. And what product velocity is, is how quickly that product is getting better. Because all of these startups are on a journey to try to find what's called product market fit. In other words, this product hits a market, aka customers, and they uh, get use out of it. And when you're dealing with year one, year two of a startup, the product velocity um, and having builder founders. In other words, the founders know how to build those products. They're not just idea people, but they actually know how to roll up their sleeves and build the products. Uh, that's when you find the really winning companies. Of course, there's many things along the way. Like yeah. How big is the market? We call that total addressable market, TAM. Um, but those things tend to get figured out later. What really matters is, can that team have product velocity? If you look at the greatest entrepreneur of our era, Elon, um, he is an engineer. People forget that um, because of you know all the stuff he's done. Uh, and at the end of the day, he's fundamentally just a great engineer. He's really great at product. If you look at Travis, yeah. he understands product uh, and he understands how to build a team. And when you see that in a founder, they know how to build a team, they Absolutely. obsess over the customers, and they know how to build a product, it seems to work out really well. You put uh, Zuckerberg in that category too. You gave us a, a great segue here. Stay right there. We're going to take a quick break because we've got a lot more to hit with Jason. He talked about Elon Musk, the greatest, of course, ingenuity guy of our time. Well, Tesla shares are extending their gains at this hour. And Elon Musk, CEO of Tesla, of course, and Jason have been besties since way back when. They're so close, Elon brought him in when he transitioned to owner of the social media company, formerly known as Twitter. What are the odds Elon can make it profitable and soon? Don't go away. X marks the spot. More with Jason Kalkanis. We are back with angel investor and all-in podcast co-host Jason Kalkanis. Uh, and we should look at Tesla shares if we can, you guys. Tesla right now, Jason, is up nearly 7%. It's had a, a really interesting day. It's just started spiking at the open, continues to go up. In a couple of past days, it hasn't done so well. But what a gain year to date. I'm looking right now, make sure we're up to date, 86%. You're very close to Tesla and SpaceX CEO Elon Musk. You were at the launch of the Starship, which got off the ground, and after a few minutes in flight, it exploded. You and I know that was actually a success because success comes Huge. in stages. What stage is Elon at with Twitter, or X as it's now known? Because he slimmed it down, got rid yeah. of a lot of employees, but the advertising has not come back in meaningful numbers. Yeah, so just to be clear, I don't work at Tesla. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't work at Twitter slash X. And uh, yeah, I'm friends with Elon, and I was there for a little bit at the beginning uh, to help with the uh, transition. Right. You know, Elon operates in decades, 
he, he's not thinking quarter to quarter or even year to year. Um, but you know, he, he's made incredible product progress. And so, when, when you're taking over a business, and remember, you know, he, he's built these businesses and the teams he has, whether it's SpaceX uh, or, or Tesla from scratch. In this case, he had to inherit a team. Uh, that's a new challenge, and I think he's done a, an incredible job. Uh, you take out 85% of uh, the, the the number of employees and the product, and they're releasing more product. So just let that sink in for a second. And if you let that sink in, <laughs> what you realize is um, on a product basis, whether you agree or disagree in the short term with decisions he's making, he's making progress. And I talked at the beginning of the show about what great entrepreneurs do and great startups do. They have product velocity. In other words, they test a lot of things. And the, the great thing about, um, I think, Elon's approach is, and I've watched him do it for 20 years. He moves incredibly fast. He's incredibly impatient. He's willing to be wrong. And uh, he can then ch change course and correct. And if you do that, yeah, sure, in the short term, you know, people might dunk on you. You may get a press story here. People disagree with what you've done. You make a mistake. But you're in action, right? You're making uh, products. You're testing them with consumers. And uh, he iterates very quickly. And very talented people who are very driven want to work for him. And that's another that is exceptional true. thing that happens. When you are truly driven, you attract the truly driven. Here in America, uh, you know, the last couple of decades, we've gotten a bit soft. People don't want to work in offices. People don't want to work 60, 70 hours a week. They want life balance. Totally understand that. People can make those choices in life. But in startups, and if you want to change the world, it's about sacrifice. And if you look at uh, startups or you know high stakes technology companies like that that want to change the world, uh, it's really like being a member of the Navy SEALs uh, without all the danger. Like Twenty four seven. Twenty four seven. Or being an, a better analogy might be being you know part of the the Golden State Warriors or an Olympian, uh, being an Olympian. You, you have to sacrifice. And if an Olympian works you know twelve hours a day at their craft, we we commend them. But for some reason, the anti business, anti capitalism sentiment in this country is all out of whack. You got these. Insane people Which on is the left. Unfortunate. Who, yeah. Unfortunate. Well, you know, it's a cycle. It's, it it's, is. It's a it process. is. That's true. But also, speaking of cycles, very interested to know because you're up there in Silicon Valley, actually, right now you're in Tahoe, but Silicon Valley usually yeah. and San Francisco. San Francisco yeah. has, and I went to Berkeley. I'm a Californian. I get it. I've seen the boom and bust there too. But this yeah. one is particularly painful. However, it almost looks like maybe there's a bottom coming. IKEA says it is moving in to San Francisco. I think they just announced they will go into the area. Do you think that that may be that pivotal moment where others say, OK, IKEA is going to fix this? It's almost like somebody else does it first. Yeah, absolutely not. <laughs> I think the bottoming out process is maybe halfway there. Really? I think there's a lot more pain and suffering to come. And, and, and I, it, it pains me to say that. I live outside the city. I spent a couple of years in the city. It's not livable if you have a family. The safety issues are just too acute. Uh, you know, I lived in a very nice area um, called Cow Hollow by Pack Heights. And, uh, you know, one morning I woke up and somebody had broken into like 20 garages and, and gone into people's homes and, and taken their stuff. When I talked to the police, they said, uh, don't bother filing a report. Now, we hadn't been broken into because I bolted the garage door shut because I knew it was a possibility. But they said, you know, don't bother. There, there, there's going to be no ramification here. So don't waste your time. Literally, the cops said that to us. And so when you see the statistics, you know, you shouldn't believe them. You should just look with your own eyes at what's happening. The suffering is incredible, um, and it's just tragic. And I think it's going to require a couple of election cycles, and you have to activate the moderate, uh, intelligent people as opposed to the virtue signaling, socialist, communist, lunatic fringe that has taken over the city. One of the big problems in our society is, I think, a lot of the people who run for office are zealots on either side of the aisle, as opposed to moderates or people who've run businesses and are operators. You know, my dream candidate for a long time was Bloomberg. I'd love to see Bezos, uh, Jamie Dimon, anybody who's right, operated right. a business, Oprah. But you know, that's therein lies the problem. Uh, yeah. Either one of these parties is is not that interested in a banker, for example. I mean, everybody around here yeah. agrees Diamond would be wonderful. Uh, it, it's sure. it's hard, really, to, to to look forward and figure out when San Francisco extricates itself from that mentality. Let's hope it's sooner Five rather years. than later. I wanted to ask you because we you mentioned Mark Zuckerberg as well in the same sentence as Elon Musk. Meta, Mark Zuckerberg's company, of course, formerly Facebook, still has Facebook. They are today, I believe, launching a, a web version of the Twitter X competitor Threads. 
I know you're on threads. Are, are you are you seeing adoption here? What what do you think? Yeah. Does it have a shot at beating Twitter by any chance? No, um, you know, and, and to be clear, if you're comparing the two those two entrepreneurs, it is night and day. That's like, you know, Zuckerberg <laughs> is uh, incredible at copying other people's innovations. That's what he's done his whole career. He's done nothing unique ever in his career, but steal other people's ideas and execute at them faster than the original uh, folks. If you look at Instagram, he bought it. WhatsApp, uh, WhatsApp, he bought it. And if you even look at Facebook, you know, it, it, all the great ideas were stolen from Twitter back in the day or from Snapchat. So he's the least creative entrepreneur, um, but he has uh, been very successful at stealing other people's ideas. Threads is just stealing the, the original idea for Twitter. Uh, and it will fail. He'll get bored with it uh, and he'll move on. And um, I think his one attempt to be creative, um, you know, buying Oculus and then maybe pouring money into virtual reality was a huge miss. So, you know, while Zuckerberg is uh, very rich and uh, very famous and, he, and he's bought some great companies, I don't think he's a great entrepreneur other than his ability to copy other people's ideas and do it 10, 20 percent better. Well, as we like to say, Americans come up with creative ideas. The Chinese like to copy. But at, at certain yeah, points... Yeah, it's very analogous to the Chinese. Yeah, yeah. Zuckerberg would be analogous to Chinese factories copying somebody else's innovation. I'm sure he wouldn't love that analogy, but regardless, we appreciate your honesty and your frankness about all of these issues. Will you come back, Jason? It's been too long since you Anytime. launched Silicon Alley Reporter. Yeah, he started. I know. For those of you who don't know, Jason, he started Silicon Alley Reporter. It was a mi can I say mimeograph? Does anybody know what that means? It, it was, was a photocopied, photocopy, yeah. exactly, yeah. newsletter about Silicon Alley here in New York. Great to see you, Jason. Thank you. My pleasure.